Mulligan, uh, Principal, Deputy, United States Chief Technology Officer and Head of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policies Technology Policy Team. Uh, and Jules Polonetsky, CEO of the Future of Privacy Forum for a fireside chat. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Good morning all, and Deirdre, thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, let me just start uh, just with a very brief uh, note of personal thanks for the um, Biden administration's support on trying to uh, help advance some resolution right now in the Mideast. Uh, our colleagues from the uh, Israel Data Protection Commissioner are obviously not with us today, and I think we're all following the news around the world with, uh, with trepidation and, uh, and concern, and so much appreciated for the, uh, the, the incredible uh, support. Uh, I know lots of people in the room and around the world are you know, shuddering and shaking as they um, react to the events of uh, a few days ago and, and react to the, the ongoing uh, loss of life. Uh, we just read about uh, a young uh, Muslim boy, um, a six-year-old killed also evidently because of uh, some reaction to, uh, uh, to the situation. So um, thank you. Um, but thank you also for a lot of the work that the administration has been doing on data protection. The first question always when we have a chance to uh, talk to somebody prominent in the administration from the global community where data protection laws are taking place and going into effect one after another uh, throughout the Caribbean, India now. The U.S. is, I think, the only one of the G20 without a comprehensive law, although one might argue that who doesn't do business in California globally or in the U.S., and so maybe we've got multiple theoretical comprehensive laws, but obviously a federal law is consequential. Um, Congress is a, a little bit broken nowadays, I, I can say that. You, you probably shouldn't. Um, those who follow know that we don't have a speaker, so it's not just privacy laws, it's no, nothing actually is happening whatsoever. So I can't blame anybody. However, can you share your thoughts on where we might be in this long process of sort of joining the rest of the civilized world with a data protection law? Yeah. Um, so first, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with this group to talk about the Biden-Harris administration's privacy agenda, and we do have one. Um, and I'm an optimist by nature, but I think there are many reasons to be optimistic about privacy. Um, I think we've never been at a point in time where people are more profoundly aware of the ways in which choices about technology and data are intimately and intricately bound up with human rights and security and competition, right? And so I think that we're, um, there's reasons for optimism because something that this community has known for a very long time is now, I think, a view that's very commonly shared. And I think that is new, and that is reason for hope. Um, I have the privilege, as Jules said, of serving as the principal deputy U.S. chief technology officer in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. Um, I know I have a difficult time understanding the functioning of other governments, and I assume that looking in at ours, it is often as just as opaque. So I thought I would just give you a, like a sentence or two about what is OSTP. Um, so we are within the executive office of the president, and we advise the president and others at the White House and the federal government on how to make technology work for the American people. We advise on a really broad range of issues. So there are folks in my team who work on web accessibility, on spectrum, on the broadband rollout. Um, we also, in my team, have the chief data scientists of the United States, whose focus for the past few years has really been on equitable data, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and importantly for this moment, we house the National AI Initiative Office, which coordinates key activities and strategic planning on AI across the US government. Um, and of course, we play a key role in privacy in multiple different ways. So um, the president, I don't, you know, I don't assume that all of you watch our State of the Unions, but you know, there's certainly something that uh, many Americans pay close attention to. And when I was in the advocacy community, you'd like sit there with bated breath, wondering if like the president was going to mention your issue, right? And privacy was very prominent in the State of the Union. 
where President Biden made it clear that we need strong, enforceable federal protections for Americans' privacy. And in, to my mind, he set out a new paradigm, at least for US privacy law, one in which companies, not consumers, bear the burden of protecting the privacy of the American public. And the president has been very actively urging Congress to pass strong bipartisan legislation to protect Americans' privacy. And he's also made it very clear that we need to be able to hold platforms accountable when they fail to address the harms caused by their technology. This includes the content they spread, to the algorithms they use, to the ways in which they affect our privacy. So I'm optimistic. Well, let me ask you this, since we're we talked a little bit about sort of the, maybe the politics of privacy. You know, the progressive left has a strong voice in advocacy. Much of the country, you know, reacted to the Black Lives Matter movement, to the concerns about uh, limiting uh, women's reproductive freedom. There's a strong sort of equity you hear. Um, you hear fairness. Uh, you hear civil rights. And, and clearly there's an intersection with data protection, but culturally and, you know, legally around the world, uh, these can be different framings. So could you help us sort of understand how the, you know, the administration looks at this? Uh, obviously, it, platforms and competition and the spread of misinformation, but how does equity and fairness and these sort of progressive social values fit into the, the thinking around AI regulation and around data protection regulation? Sure, I do wanna, I wanna flag one thing. I, um, privacy and human rights, I think, are something that can unify. Right, having worked as an advocate, have, as a researcher, and now in the government, privacy is often a very bipartisan issue. Right, It brings together progressives and libertarians. It can bring together conservatives who are concerned about you know, government overreaching. And so it can be an issue, depending on where it lands, that is, um, I think, both incredibly appealing because of the ways in which we use it to structure relationships between each other, between each other and powerful companies, and between individuals in the state. And so I think that it resonates across the public and across political ideologies in ways that are really powerful and reflect its kind of ongoing importance and utility, right? Like privacy is actually really useful. Um, but kind of more directly, Jules, to your point, uh, I think it is um, important to see the way in which privacy is so deeply entangled with some of the pressing challenges facing our country. Um, and you know, I'll let you all speak for your own, but facing our country. And President Biden has spoken really forcefully about the importance of, and I really want to quote him, the right to privacy that serves as a basis for so many other rights that are ingrained in the fabric of our country, right? So privacy is both intrinsically important and extrinsically important, right? That we need it because it is so important for our development of ourselves, for the formation of communities, for the development of the independent citizens that we expect in a vibrant democracy. But it is also a fundamental enabler of everything from reproductive freedom to political organizing. And so when you look at some of the actions that the federal, the administration has been able to take in the absence of congressional action, um, you can see that they really are responsive to some of these issues that Jules has teed up. So for example, the administration has strengthened protections for patient privacy including by addressing the transfer and sales of sensitive health-related data, combating digital surveillance related to the reproductive health care services, and protecting people seeking reproductive health care from inaccurate information, fraudulent, fraudulent schemes, and deceptive practices. Right? And this is like an insight into the way in which privacy is so important in those kinds of freedoms that we take for granted. Um, similarly, in the um, our early executive order on police and accountability, the administration called for both examinations of the ways in which the use of equitable data can help us better understand police practices and make sure it aligns with our expectations of fairness and justice and equal treatment, 
And currently, we are working um, within the administration and across um, the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security looking at how agencies, both at the federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial levels, use biometric technologies, including facial recognition and predictive algorithms, and looking at the implications of the use of those technologies, yes, for privacy, but also for equal, equal protection and non-discrimination concerns. And we will be you know, producing uh, some recommendations out of that to guide um, updates to policy and practice to make sure that when we use technology, we do it in a way that aligns with our most fundamental rights and values. So speaking of sort of obscure government process, the <laughs> folks who followed the sort of cross-border EU-US uh, debates heard a lot about executive orders and how they bind government, but they're not legislative, but for the purposes of restricting and ordering government agencies to act, they're de facto law. Uh, there's been uh, some degree of public uh, awareness that there's an executive order uh, coming. Um, can you share any sort of framing, um, uh, you know, the cloud services world um, really um, added significant privacy and security when the government mandated for all of government cloud services, here were the criteria that had to be in place, and vendors throughout but, you know, the world who wanted to be able to serve government agencies or work with those who worked with government agencies, it, it had a real magnifying effect. So can you share with us where the non-legislative path, given the administration's uh, opportunities around an executive order might be? Yeah, so the administration, I think, has been, there's probably no place where it's been more active in relationship to technology than around artificial intelligence. and. Um, early on, you know, the uh, administration made really clear that when there's a new technology that is potentially disruptive, offering kind of equal parts innovation and risk, it's a really important time to be clear about your values. And so the Office of Science and Technology Policy, after many, many hours of public consultation and comments from the public and office hours, the thing that we imported from academia into the Office of Science and Technology Policy, we produced the blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights. And that document basically says, you know, in these choppy waters, here are the values and the rights that are really the guiding star that should direct how we not just manage the risk of the technology, but how we put it to good use. Right, that we do think this technology has the possibility to help us address really pressing global challenges from climate change to the development and identification of new drugs. Right? And so whenever we think about a technology, we want to think about how we use it. Right? Do we use it to basically drive ads, or do we use it to tackle the world's biggest problems? And so the framing on this is not just about risk mitigation, but it's also about a vision right, for how we should use new technology and what should guide it. Um, so being clear right, about what our vision is for the use of the technology. Um, shortly after that, we released, uh, NIST released the AI Risk Management Framework. And that, in combination with the uh, blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights, provides kind of both, like, here's the guiding star, and here's a tool to help you implement. Um, it is, of course, it's a risk management tool, and every entity is going to have different ideas about their risk tolerance and how to balance risk and which values and which rights are implicated by their design of their products. And I think you can look, for example, at the AI Act and see some real similarities, right, about thinking about different tranches of risk and what sorts of mitigations might be appropriate. But that's a second thing that the administration did without congressional involvement um, to advance our ability to use AI in ways that align with our rights. Um, we have also invested in uh, establishing a, a research agenda, the National AI Research Oh, darn, I always forget the last R. Anyway, very busy like articulating what our research agenda is and hopefully trying to develop a resource center as well so there's a public option 
um, allowing uh, individuals to design and build models with data sets and compute power, et cetera, so that the resources that right now are held by a limited set of companies might be available more broadly for the public. Um, so yes, <laughs> um, there is a suite of executive actions that are coming and uh, it, they will be broad and big and bold, and I can't really say much more about them, um, but it has been a real honor to get to work on the broad range of areas in which AI affects people's lives and to think about what more we need to do to guide its development and implementation. Um, and as uh, Jules was pointing out, one of the key ways that large entities like the US government can shape the ways in which this technological future unfolds is by leading by example and putting our money where our mouth is. And we're doing both of those things. And so the Office of Management and Budget will be releasing um, guidance. And that guidance is basically helping the US government walk the walk, right? So we have these values, we have this risk management framework, we need to make sure that as the US government is developing, purchasing, and deploying technologies that we are doing the things that we expect of others. And when we talk about expecting them of others, we, the president has also you know, convened and communicated with companies and we had 15 AI companies commit to a set of voluntary principles that are aligned with that vision of trying to develop and use this technology responsibly. So we are really trying to use kind of all the levers that we have at the, as, an, as the administration, um, and of course seeking to work closely with Congress. Kids and teens. Yeah. You just mentioned the youth agenda, obviously one of the key issues. Yeah. Um, so the president has been particularly um, concerned about safeguarding children's health, privacy, and safety from online harms. And um, we had a US Surgeon General's advisory on social media and youth mental health, which described the current evidence of the impacts of social media on children and adolescents, and states that we cannot conclude social media is sufficiently safe for children. So in the wake of that, um, through some executive actions, the administration stood up um, the Task Force on Kids Online Health and Safety, which is chaired by the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Commerce, and they're leading an interagency process. The goal is really to advance the health, safety, and privacy of minors online, with particular attention to preserving and mitigating the adverse health effects of online platforms on minors. Um, the task force just kind of, it's been meeting the first kind of publicly visible example of the work um, uh, came out last month from the Department of Commerce, which released a request for comments to learn more about social media and online platforms, impacts on minors, current industry practices, and ways in which the private sector, caregivers, and the U.S. government may counter negative effects, and we will be ramping up and broadening our stakeholder engagement with a wide range of experts very shortly. Um, the president has made it like very clear that tackling the unprecedented mental health crisis among American teens is a top priority. And given the growing evidence that social media and other online platforms are contributing to this crisis, bolstering privacy protections is a really important part of that solution. We spend a lot of time at the Future Privacy Forum on pets, and I thought that the yeah. national strategy um, around privacy enhancing technologies had some interesting nuance, and it echoes a couple of the things you already said. Um, if these are technologies that are only gonna be available to the biggest or the wealthiest or the richest, that's not exactly perhaps societal end goal, or if pets are simply a way to avoid regulation, but yet perhaps leave us with de facto some of the same concerns um, uh, because of the ability to sort of technically solve a narrow legal problem, but yet we're still perhaps unhappy with the uh, outcome. So how do you sort of square that circle? On one hand, obviously some, some problems do get solved 
when you're able to eliminate them through sophisticated data identification. Uh, others uh, perhaps uh, need more than simply a technical solution and a broader sort of social understanding of uh, who's using it, how it's being used. So welcome your thoughts. Yeah. Um, so I want to start by saying, like, just kind of confirming your perspective on, like, you know, developing a technology that has the capacity to do good things for privacy doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to lead to good outcomes. And um, several years ago, I did some research with Cynthia Dork, who's one of the uh, founders, creators of differential privacy. And we looked at all of the implementations of differential privacy at that moment, and I think there were seven or 10 of them. And we did qualitative interviews to find out like what drove the adoption, what kind of privacy were they actually delivering. All of the conversations we're having about like the inscrutability of algorithms, well, differential privacy is uh, basically an algorithm, right? And there are a lot of choices there's epsilon, as in like, how do we dial between privacy and accuracy? But there's a whole host of other choices that one makes when thinking about developing and deploying those models that really profoundly shape whether you get a lot of privacy or you get very little privacy gain. But the most interesting thing we found, or one of the most interesting things, was that very few of the implementations were being used to shore up an existing data set. Right, to make it less invasive of privacy. Most of the deployments were being used to collect more information that previously hadn't been able to be collected. And I think that's a really like, important illustration of Jules' point. So when I got to OSTP, I was super delighted because this report was already basically in clearance. Um, and so I can't really take credit, although there are some other people, like Naomi Lefkowitz, in, in the audience who can take a lot of credit for what is in this report. Um, and it's the National Strategy to Advance Privacy Preserving Data Sharing and Analytics. And what I thought was so brilliant about this report when I came in is that it leans in very hard on the idea that we need to have a national strategy for deployment. Right? We can't just let the agencies, which in the US often are the defense agencies, the intelligence agencies, agencies that have a lot of budget and a lot of technical expertise benefit from the use of this technology. That we need to make sure that the social service agencies, that the healthcare agencies, that OPM, right, our personnel management agencies, are equally able to use these technologies if we really want to make sure that they deliver the promise to heighten the privacy protections that we're offering to individuals who interact with the government. And so I, um, this strategy, I think, is really um, important because of that vision. There's many other good parts of it, and I would encourage you to look at it. But to me, the vision, as Jules said, was the most important part. I'll close with two final thoughts. Um, one of the interesting uh, challenges, of course, for uh, privacy-preserving technologies going forward is how does one deal with all the public uh, data, the public personal data that is available that is being used to train these models. We've got a collection of data protection authorities from multiple regions that at the site event at the end of today will be sharing how in their jurisdictions this question, which is not novel, we're all debating it suddenly because of the AI and the machine learning, but obviously how one deals with this is something that regulators have been dealing with for a very long time, and so please do join us. And if you've got a long plane ride back, I always question, just because someone's been in academia and they've written things and they've got you know, a very free, you know, creative uh, you know, uh, uh, path, once they're in government, you can't say, well, you wrote that here, so you know, now we have to hold you to that. The, the, the rules and the complexities are different. However, I'm a little worried about where we're going. you will be well served to take a look at the decades of privacy legal, privacy technical, and other scholarship that Deirdre and her team and her co-authors have done at Berkeley and beyond, some really phenomenal uh, scholarship that I think uh, really stands the test of time. And so thank you. Really thank lucky you. to have you in government. And thank you all for your attention this morning. Thank you so much.